what's going on with, uh, with Google and Amazon and some of the like non social media, large tech companies in your opinion? Yeah. So, um, Google is in the middle. So in the book, I talk a little bit about how, um, Google, people think Google is this company, uh, that figured out how to do search and just wrote it to a multi, you know, hundred billions of dollars of valuation. And that was it. But Google is this company that's really gone through so many different transformations in its history. It started out as a website you would access on Microsoft's browser, Internet Explorer. Then it really became a browser extension on Internet Explorer. I don't know if you know many people remember, but um, the primary way that people used to access Google was through Google Toolbar, which is an extension you would install onto Internet Explorer, and it would like show up in the browser's you know Chrome. Every Chrome is everything that's not part of the browsing window. Uh, and you would type your searches in and it would show up in the browser. Actually, more than 60% of Google search went through toolbar at a certain time. So Google was an extension. Um, then the Google team saw, led by Sundar Pichai, who's now the CEO of Alphabet, uh, they saw that Microsoft was starting to mess with them a little bit with that toolbar. As you might imagine, Microsoft was like, we're delivering billions of dollars to value, of value to Google, uh, and we own the browser, so why are we continuing to do this? And so Google realized that the longer it depended on Microsoft, which was then working on live search, which would become Bing, it was going to be dead. And that's when it really had to build its own browser. And it's funny, I remember seeing ads for Chrome and being like, why is Google building a browser? Why is the search engine so intent on the browser? Um, but Chrome saved the company. And without building its own successful browser where you can type your searches in the address bar, you know, we might be binging today. Like that might be the verb. Um, and so that, that's obviously Chrome worked out really well for them. So Google's safe, but then we move from desktop to mobile. All of a sudden they need to reinvent again. Um, and they do that using Android, which they acquire and then build up. Um, and then, you know, we start, we start getting into this mobile world. All of a sudden, um, voice computing happens. And what you do with Google is you ask it questions, you know. What time is, is this going to happen at, you know, where did this take place? And people start asking the, you know, Amazon echo these questions. This is Google's bread and butter. So Google needed to reinvent again. Uh, and that's where it started developing the Google assistant. Sundar brings the whole company together. Uh, and so he does, he puts this big slide up in front of the, in front of the company and it's all Google's products. And then there's like this squiggly line. And it points to assistant and said, the number one thing that we're doing in this company is turning what we have into one cohesive assistant, uh, the Google assistant. And I think that like, this is going to be Google's future is whether it can make that assistant overtake, um, you know, the echo, I can't say here, let me pause, uh, mute it. Um, sorry, overtake Alexa, uh, or, um, you know, it, it can't lose that. And, and if Google, if the Google assistant is good, then all of a sudden it propels all, all the Google products you use. It propels Android and it propels the Google Home, which is still second to the Echo. Uh, but if you look at the order, um, you know, the Echo is, is, has the lead, then you got Google, then there's like an other category and somewhere deep inside that other category, which has very few units sold is Apple's HomePod. Um, so <laughs> Apple is totally uh, letting this revolution slip by it. Um, in terms of Amazon, you know, Amazon's like this invention factory, uh, it's culture. You know, I talked a little bit about, you know, working on ideas versus working on execution and its culture has, um, you know, baked in an, a, like incredible technology that allow its employees to um, focus on invention. And that's why Amazon's been able to go from, you know, an online bookseller to a massive first party marketplace, a third party marketplace, logistics and fulfillment operation, a cloud services platform, a voice computing platform, a hardware manufacturer, and a grocer and an Academy Award winning movie studio is because the company knows how to operate. Its process is baked in. And we're starting to see some of the fruits of, um, you know, its most ambitious AI program uh, called Hands Off the Wheel. And I go into that in depth uh, in the book. Hands Off the Wheel is a way that Amazon used machine learning to automate a, a good amount of tasks in its retail organization. So it's retail employees uh, were on the phone with like brands like Tide and saying, we need this many detergent units and this many fulfillment centers, you know, at this time for this price. And Amazon looked at itself and was like, we got two decades worth of retail purchase data. 
why are we having people do this? We can just have software. And then slowly but surely over the last few years, they've worked to automate all these tasks. So uh, if you're tied right now, a machine sends you the purchase order, uh, you get an email, right? You go and negotiate with a portal. Um, the pricing and promotions are all done with technology, not people. It used to be a very big organization inside Amazon. And by freeing those people up, the company's really been able to invent, you know, his next new products. My favorite story is one of this guy, uh, Dilip Kumar, who ran pricing and promotions in the retail organization. He goes and spends like a year and a half under Bezos taking meetings that he, that Bezos was taking as his technical advisor. By the time he's done, pricing and promotions is totally automated. So we can't go back to this division. So he gets together with a bunch of people from Amazon's retail organization that are feeling displaced and need to do something new. And they say, why don't we use technology to solve the most annoying part of shopping in real life, which is checkout. And that is the team that developed Amazon Go, which you can just walk in and take something out uh, and then it charges you. Um, you know, you, you, there's no scanning. You scan in once with a QR code, grab what you want and then walk out. It feels like stealing. It's probably the future of brick and mortar retail period. Uh, I think that these systems we're going to see in supermarkets all over the place uh, and, and in stores. And, and I think that Amazon's really hit on something with this. And it all happened because they were able to use technology to change the way they work and make room for more invention and have the process to invent. So I think that company is, um, you know, really good shape from a business standpoint. The only caveat I'll make with Amazon is um, the company needs more empathy. Uh, you can tell by the way that they've engaged in this coronavirus moment that they, they, they've fired their whistleblowers. Uh, they've tried to run a nasty PR campaign targeting somebody in their fulfillment center that spoke up um, saying he was inarticulate and they wanted to make him the face of um, you know, worker resistance. And honestly, like it's much easier just to treat your workers well than to go through all this effort and the PR campaign to try to make somebody look bad. And I think at a certain point, Amazon needs to realize that because, you know, can, can, you know consumers might one day actually say, I want to go to a, a company that's first priority is making sure that the people that work for it it's safe, are safe and making sure that the businesses that sell into it are sustainable. That's good for everyone. And if Amazon doesn't prioritize that, it's going to be in bad shape.